Well, we can't bring the cities here. We're a bit short of supporters. But we can bring the atom here to the theatre. Let's suppose that the atom were as big as the theatre. I've brought you a measure of the nucleus in here as well. Can somebody with good eyesight come and help me find this? Nobody with good eyesight. Have you got eyes? Great. Hello, what's your name? Alex. Right, Alex. Now, hanging from the ceiling here, somewhere in the theatre, we've got the atomic nucleus. For those people at the back who can't see it, can you find it? <laughs> the ball bearing here. Right. Can everybody see the ball bearing? Does everybody agree that that's the atomic nucleus? No. The ball bearing actually is just holding this wire in place. The nucleus is that little knot in the wire that we have added. Thanks very much. Now you really know how small it is. So, we've established that the atom is not the last layer of the cosmic onion. The atom is made of the positive charge in the middle and the negative charges whirling around on the outside. The atomic nucleus has been discovered. Now, scientists don't like hanging about. The moment they discover the nucleus, they want to know what's going on there. What's the nucleus made of? Is that the last layer of the cosmic onion, or is there more inside? Well, to help answer that question and to show how it was done, we're going to play a game of nuclear billiards. And to help us with this, we've got Teresa, who is a champion, but I should probably say a snooker champion, but I shall call it nuclear billiards, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, what I'm going to ask Teresa to do, I'm going to be pretty tough on her. I'm not wanting her to show her, her regular skills. What I want you to do is to very accurately just hit this ball without any trick effects. And what I'm going to ask the audience to do is not to watch where any individual ball goes, but watch the two balls as they go apart from each other and look at the angle between them. It should be something like a right angle. Okay. Okay. I wish I could do that. <laughs> right? For those of you who are blinking or falling asleep, let's try one more time. Okay, you've got that? Well, no expense spared here. We've videoed that in slow motion. Let's see what happened. So this is the slow motion picture of what Teresa has just done. What's the cue ball coming in? When it hits the red, the 90 degrees. That's what happens when something of the same mass strike each other and recoil. So, going backwards <laughs> and forwards. There you are, the 90 degrees. So that's the signal that two balls of the same mass have hit each other. Now what Therese is going to do is, first of all, show us what happens when you hit something that's much lighter. The angle between them is much narrower. And finally, when you hit something that's much heavier, it bounces back a very wide angle between them. Thanks very much. So we've seen there on the billiard table what happens. You can bounce things of different masses against each other and from the angle between them, work out the relative masses. The same mass at 90 degrees, lighter particles narrow, heavier ones big. And we can now do that in our cloud chamber with real nuclear particles. So the first picture shows what happens when we fire nuclear particles of the same mass against each other. They leave trails which move out at 90 degrees, the signal of equal mass bouncing. The next picture shows us what happens when you hit something that's lighter than the cue ball. In this case, a nuclear cue ball has hit a lighter nucleus and the angle between them is less than 90 degrees. And the final picture, when you hit something that's heavier than you, the thing bounces back. The angle is much bigger than 90 degrees. So just from this, you're seeing that you can start measuring the relative weights of different nuclear particles just by looking at the angle of bounce. The cloud chamber is being used 
to demonstrate the real world of the atomic nucleus. It's the very same rules of momentum and bounce that apply on the big billiard table are applying here in the world of the atomic nucleus. It's being brought to life. You're seeing the trails of where the nuclear particles have been. And this is really what particle physics is all about. We look at hundreds and thousands of pictures like these and gradually be able to decipher them and work out what has been going on. In this particular case, we've worked out the relative masses of the nuclei of different elements. And at the end of all this, the message is finally deciphered. That all elements, the nuclei at the center of their atoms, are made of essentially the same stuff. Two basic particles, the proton, which is positively charged, and its twin, the neutral neutron. Protons and neutrons put together build you up the atomic nuclei of all the various elements. In fact, everything, solids, liquids and gases, deep at the heart of the atom, the nucleus, is always made of those same two things. The simplest of all, hydrogen has just got a single proton at the heart of its nucleus, whereas the next one, helium, has got two protons and two neutrons. And so it is right the way across the whole of the atomic elements. And finally, it's this fact that is going to give us the answer to what's going on inside the sun. The fact that all the different elements are at the nuclear level made of the same basic ingredients, the protons and neutrons, means that we can break the nuclei apart, change one element into another. Transmutation of the elements, what the alchemists have been trying to do for years, has finally been achieved. Rutherford, when he realized this fact, realized the incredible thing that had been done. You could make gold. Unfortunately, it took more effort and expense to make gold this way than to dig it out of the ground, but the idea is there. So you can change one element into another by changing the way that the basic protons and neutrons in the nucleus hang together. So finally from this, we've come to the key of how the sun works. It all hangs on these two, the lightest of all. Hydrogen with its single proton and helium with its four. It was around 1920 or so when Arthur Eddington got the idea and put it all together. Suppose that the sun is made of hydrogen. Nobody actually knew that for sure, by the way, at that stage. But hydrogen, we now know, is the most common stuff in the whole of the universe. And the sun and all stars are essentially hydrogen. If these little protons of the hydrogen bumped into each other, they could fuse together and build up heavier nuclei, like this of helium. That was his idea. Maybe the fuel was hydrogen and the waste product, helium. That was the first part of it. The second thing, though, which really got him excited was very accurate measurements of the relative masses of these nuclei, such as we've been doing in the cloud chamber bounces, showed that the total mass of these four, when bound together in helium nucleus, was a little bit less than four individual ones of the hydrogens that started it off. Now that was a surprise. And he thought, you start off with four lots of mass, you bind them together and a little bit has disappeared. Mass has disappeared. Albert Einstein, E equals mc squared. Mass can be turned into energy. That little bit of mass that's disappeared has been turned into energy, the energy of the sun. Now, it may only be a little bit of mass, but look, it's multiplied by a number here which is the velocity of light, which is a large number. In fact, it's a large number squared, so it's a huge number. So Eddington then realized that little bit of mass that had disappeared when you started with four protons and brought them together to make the single nucleus of helium, that was being emitted as energy, and that is where the power of the sun was coming from. Terrific. But there's a problem here. 